All right, so this is one of the classes that I like to have early on, and I always, always cover this topic because it's the, probably the comment that I have to make on essays the most frequently, um, both with fledgling writers and expert writers. This is a very common mistake and it's one that some students don't even understand why it's not a good thing to do. Um, so what we're going to cover today is how to properly integrate quotes into your essay. Um, and what I mean by integrating is making sure that the quote is part of a sentence and followed up. Um, there is a mistake where you put the quote in as its own sentence and just pop it in and move on. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, where was I going with that? Having the, the quote stand as a sentence all by itself with no explanation and no tying it to the rest of the, the paragraph. Um, and this is not correct and it's not correct for several reasons. Um, the first is being that you have not shown to me that you understand why that quote is necessary for that paragraph. How does that quote actually help you prove the topic sentence of that paragraph? And of course, eventually in the long run, the thesis statement of the essay, okay? Um, I know how to Google quotes too. Uh, maybe if you're writing a paragraph about, you know, let's go, the crucible's the first one. Maybe you're writing a paragraph about Rebecca Nurse. Um, I can go to Google too and click and go Rebecca nurse quote and come up with a sentence and throw it in the paragraph. Okay, anybody can do that. Any five-year-old could do that. Um, not necessarily, but you, you get what I mean. Um, so therefore it is necessary to make sure that you interpret the quote enough to explain its significance and its importance. Why does it actually help you prove your topic sentence? Okay, so um, if I'm trying to prove a particular topic in a paragraph, I'm going to choose a quote that is proper evidence of that topic. But I also need to make sure that I'm not allowing the, that quote to do its own work. I need to do the work and I need to use that quote. Okay, um, so that's probably one of the biggest reasons, but is to prove that you understand your evidence and how your evidence proves your topic. But the other reason is to assume is that you should never, ever assume that your reader understands why you use that quote. I have had situ certain situations, even though I'm very familiar with these texts, I've had certain situations where I was really unsure as to why a student had used a particular quote. Um, that's, it may have made perfect sense in the student's mind, but because they did not properly integrate the quote nor explain it, um, I didn't, I didn't know. I was very confused and I even marked them down because I did not understand how that quote helped them in that paragraph because it didn't seem to match at all. Um, so that could have been, A, they just used the wrong quote. They just were rushing along and just did a crummy job or they had this complex thought process as to why that quote was a good use uh, in that paragraph, but because they didn't tie it in or explain it at all, I had no idea if they actually knew that or what that complex thought process was. Um, so briefly, I do wanna go over um, something that I cover with my sixth graders, and then um, I'm gonna show you a website that's really helpful in learning different methods of tying and integrating quotes in to your paragraphs. In sixth grade, um, and you may remember this, but in sixth grade, it becomes necessary, part of the sixth grade standards, are to include evidence in your writing and then to include quotes. It's where you start learning to cite evidence. You may start learning it a little bit in fifth grade, but sixth grade is where you really try to hit it hard. Um, I am a sixth grade teacher, um, so this is something that I do yearly, on a yearly basis. Um, in seventh grade, you're supposed to use two pieces of evidence per paragraph. So if I asked you a question about a text, a textual, a text-based question and I needed you to answer the question and provide evidence that you're correct. Um, different schools use different 
methods and use different um, acronyms. But at my school, we use RACES, R-A-C-E-S. When you're answering a text-based question, which can also be used for the paragraphs of an essay, you have a specific formula that you follow in order to make sure that you have covered everything. The R is to restate the question. This is your topic sentence, um, along with the A, which is answer the question. So restate and answer the question. This is your topic sentence. Um, another issue that I, I th I'd say the top two issues even for the strong writers that I still, I always, always have to mention is poor integration of quotes and poor topic sentences, okay? So remember your topic sentence is basically going to be a mini thesis statement. You're going to take a piece of your thesis statement and prove it with your paragraph. So your first sentence needs to tell your reader what you're proving in that paragraph, okay? So that's the RA of the races restate and answer the question in your topic sentence, okay? Um, of course, with a full paragraph, especially for a high school level, a level essay, you're going to put a little bit more explanation in there, maybe background material. Um, but the C in races is cite. So that's where you include the quote. I also teach my students how to use sentence frames. All quotes need to be tied into that paragraph using sentence frames. And of course, in sixth grade, the, sixth, the sentence phrases are very basic and very simple and are something as simple as the set text says or the author stated on page 27 or something even as basic as that because I want them to get in the habit of never, ever dropping a quote into the middle of a paragraph. As you get into high school, you will use more um appropriate sentence frames but you could still call it a sentence frame that works um the e in races is explain it means to explain the evidence um again i teach my sixth graders very very simple sentence frames in order to get them into that habit and you're welcome to use them as well but you are obviously going to want to develop that skill good sentence frames to start your ease your explains for your quote is such things as since and therefore or because of this or something like that where you're going to take that quote and you're going to give a little bit more information <coughs> to show your reader and your person who's grading your essay that you understand that quote and you're, you understand what's happening and you need to make sure that your audience follows you in your understanding. The last thing, the S uh, for races stands for sum it up, okay? Since and therefore are also good words to start your sum it up is to just kind of tie everything together. And that's like the last sentence of your paragraph um, is to make sure everything is tied together. Never, ever, ever end a sentence with your quote because that means you didn't explain it. That means that you didn't tell me how that quote works. Okay. One of the things that might be helpful is to assume that the person who is reading your essay has not read the book. This does not mean that you're going to summarize the entire book. That's a book report. When you're writing an analytical essay, you do not include too much summary. You only include the little bits and pieces that are necessary to understand the story. For example, with the Crucible, of course, you're going to want to talk about how um, you're going to, want to talk about how it's about the Salem witch trials and there was hysteria and how um, some of them were lying and some of them, you know, were manipulating the situation to prove to help them out with the, their greedy needs, whatever. Whatever it is that you're trying to prove, you're going to, going to include in your introduction. I would not ever give more than two sentences of summary of background. That's that's enough. And then in your actual body paragraphs, you're going to give enough information to explain your point and your direction. But you are going to assume that your reader has not read the text. Therefore, why does your quote work? What does it show? Um, what is the purpose of this quote in proving your topic sentence? That's very important. Okay, so don't forget that. Even if you need to remember that real basic sixth grade, you know, R-A-C-E-S, races, that's fine. Um, you do need to build on that and, and increase in that and include, and include more 
um, higher level of thinking on a high school level. Um, but going back to those sixth grade basic skills is still useful and helpful. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to turn my webcam off. I apologize. I've been I'm recovering from a cold, so my voice is coming in and out. I'm going to switch off webcam and I'm going to go to screen share. Um, and I'm going to show you a website that I like to give to students that are having trouble learning how to integrate their quotes um, because it does give you some really great suggestions on how to tie the quote to the paragraph without just bloop, dropping it in webcam off screen share on it's it's building give me a second takes a second to initialize there we go no nope, not yet entire screen all right all right, this is, I don't even know what the source of this is, but I have found this particular website to be very useful. It's not particularly long, um, but I do find it useful in, in learning some useful ways to tie quotes into sentences. Um, I'm gonna start with the par this paragraph and then I'm gonna give a couple examples, but I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I will provide you with the links so that you can read it yourself. Um, you should never have a quotation standing alone as a complete sentence or worse, as an incomplete sentence in your writing. The quotation will seem disconnected from your own thoughts and from the flow of your sentences. Ways to integrate quotations into your own sentences with correct use of punctuation are explained below. Um, the most common one that you're going to be using is going to be... Um, number two and number three. These are very, very common. Um, however, you can use number one, which is um, using a colon. Okay, so introduce the quotation with a complete sentence and a colon. Okay, so for example, take a look at this one here. Thoreau ends his essay with a metaphor. Well, because Thoreau ends his essay with a metaphor is a complete sentence, in order to tie it with the actual metaphor that's being provided, you need a colon. You need something stronger than a comma because this is a complete sentence, okay? This is not something that is used very often. Um, I don't see high schoolers using this method very often, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here um, because a lot, most of what we're writing is not about essays in, and um, speeches. It's more about, we write mostly about um, nonfiction, uh, nonfiction, short stories, plays, novels, that kind of stuff. So it doesn't necessarily come into play. All right. Um, the number rule, rule number two, and this is the one that I see used the most frequently. Um, because it just tends to work best and is kind of what I consider the easiest to use, therefore most common in the high school essays, it is using an introductory or explanatory phrase, not a complete sentence, but separated from the quotation with a comma. This is going to be the most common one. Um, this is going to be possible right here. Thoreau asks, why should we live with such a hurry and waste of life? Okay. Um, you could say, uh, what happens, something like um, Hale says, or um, Rebecca tries to ref defend herself saying, comma, and then include what she says, or something like that where you're introducing the character who's speaking and maybe what they're doing and why they say what they're saying or what the purpose is of what they're saying. Um, so according to Thoreau, that could be a possibility. Um, you should use a comma to separate your own words from the quotation when your introductory or explanatory phrase ends with a verb such as says, said, thinks, believes, pondered, recalls, questions, and asks, and many more. You should also use a comma when you're introducing, introduce a quote with a phrase such as, according to Thoreau. Again, if it's an incomplete piece of a sentence, 
that is going to lead your reader directly into a quote, more often than not, it's going to be using a comma. Um, this, this last one, number three, only works in certain situations. Again, number two is going to be the one that you use most commonly, where you give some level of introduction or explanation and then a comma. But number three takes skill and very careful writing. Um, this is when you make the quotation a part of your own sentence without any punctuation between your words and the words you were quoting, with the exception of course quotation marks. So, so Thoreau argues that shams and delusions are esteemed for soundest truths while reality is fabulous. As you can see, this rolled very smoothly from the introduction and explanation and directly into the quote itself. This being, it's an introducing the quote by who's speaking, Thoreau, and that they're arguing something, and then includes what they're actually saying. Um, according to Thoreau, people are often, are too often thrown off track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. Notice that the word that is used in three of the examples above. And when it is used in the example, that replaces the comma, which would be necessary without that in the sentence. We usually have a choice then when you begin a sentence with a phrase such as Thoreau says. You can either add a comma after says, or you can add the word that with no comma. But it does need to be able, able to actually flow well. Okay. Um, so that takes a little bit more skill, but essentially the, the way this explains it, it makes the uh, word that and a comma interchangeable. Okay, I see students doing this. The more experienced writers or the more um, practiced writers do this, this number four, rule number four. Um, and I really do appreciate it, especially in a research essay. In a research essay, which you will write at the end of the semester, near the end, it's going to be due like the last, the very last week of school. Um, in a research essay, it can be really difficult to integrate quotes and evidence without directly, you know, without plagiarizing. OK, because it can get kind of annoying to put in tons and tons of quotes, but you want to include very specific details from your reading and your research. Well, this is a great way to do that, which is using short quotations, only a few words as part of your sentences. Again, it does take some skill to use this, do this correctly, but it can be very useful in something like a research essay where you don't want to include a billion different sentences from your research. You just want to include the important details. You may still want to include a few long, full sentences, but just including some of these details along the way is very helpful and shows that you really, truly did read and understand your research. So using a short quotation, um, like, uh, let's look at, Let's look at the second one. Thoreau argues that people blindly accept shams and delusions as the soundest truths while regarding reality as fabulous. So the reality is that, that this sentence here was probably a combination of multiple sentences with the most important details pulled out and tied together in a more of a summary, a summary form. This is a brilliant use of this method. When you integrate quotes in this way, you do not use any special punctuation. Instead, you should punctuate the sentence as if you would all the words were your own. No punctuation is necessary in the sentence above, in part because the sentences do not follow the pattern explained under moment and two. There's not a complete sentence in front of the quotations and words such as say, says, said, or asked do not appear directly in front of the quoted words. All the methods above for integrating quotes are correct, but you shouldn't rely, avoid relying too much on just one method. You should instead use a variety of methods. Okay, so like I said, students tend to rely the most on method two. Okay, with um, an introductory phrase or explanatory phrase with a comma. That's the most common thing that students rely on. But I really think that students need to dabble around with some of these other ideas. Um, because they could really do could really help add variety to writing as well as just a little extra you know knowledge you know to show this show skill of writing 
Um, I'm not going to read the rest of this. There are really only two uh, punctuation marks used to introduce quotes, the comma and the colon. Uh, semicolon is not used to introduce quotes. So commas and colons can both be used, uh, but they have to be used in very specific ways. Let me get, grab this website for you, and I'm going to paste it here in the jigsaw. I'm going to stop sharing as well. There you go. Okay, so that's there in, in the... Um, in the chat box. I often provide this um, link when I am grading essays and the feedback as one as one of my um, feedback responses, common feedback responses to help students um, improve their writing. Um, I will check every single quote in your essay. Sometimes there's only three, sometimes there's two per paragraph, which is the typical expected is two per paragraph. Um, well, actually it's one per body paragraph, but I always definitely really do prefer to see two. Um, I check every quote. If it's not properly integrated, I mark it. And then it's like, and then I put this particular website in the, um, in the chat, the, uh, response box in the chat box. All right, so do remember that we're talking about two concepts here. We're talking about integrating the quote properly within a sentence in order to ex explain or introduce that quote, as well as following it up with an explanation. Oftentimes, the students forget to integrate the quotes. They also forget to explain. Um, now, if you're... Let's back this up a little bit. Quotes are not there to support the summary and facts of your story. Quotes are there to show significant evidence that supports a claim. Okay, so for example, and this is just because it's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, in the book, The Great Gatsby, if you are attempting to prove that Daisy is materialistic, um, one quote that you could use that solidly per, 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 uh, supports that um, is if you were writing, if you're trying to prove if Daisy is materialistic and you're writing about how she's only attracted to Gatsby because he's rich now. The quote that you could use to support that claim is the quote where she's in his closet and sees all of his fancy shirts and starts to cry over his fancy shirts. Okay, so in order to properly integrate that, you could say something to the effect of Daisy displays her materialism when she sees, uh, and then include the quote, and she began to cry over Gatsby's shirts or whatever the exact quote is. This shows Daisy's materialism because she now realizes that she could have had everything she wanted had she stayed with Gatsby because he eventually became rich. Okay, and she did actually prefer him over her, not the husband she married because he was rich. Um, but you have to show, this shows that. Okay, so if I just pop in a quote into the paragraph about Daisy crying over shirts, and this has happened, and it's one of the reasons I bring this one up. If you just include a quote about Daisy crying over shirts and don't explain it, there could be a million reasons she could be crying over shirts. Maybe Gatsby uses mothballs in his closet and she's allergic to mothballs. Okay? You can't, you have to tell me why she's crying. Why is it significant that she's crying? Because this is an analytical essay. Okay, is showing that you really truly understand the concept and the topics behind what you're being asked to do and the topics of your essay. Um, and you know, the major themes of the text that you're writing about. Um, now let's go back to the crucible real quick. Let's say choosing your quotes again is very important because um, you need to show the analysis and not the summary. For example, students that write about Reverend Hale in the Crucible, 
Okay, one of the quotes that they like to use is the quote where he says, I quit this court. That's not a bad quote to use. However, it should not be the basis of your paragraph. That doesn't necessarily prove anything. Why did he quit the court? That's what's important, and you need a quote that supports the why. All right? I need every single writer that ever comes through my classroom to ask the why is not the hows. Not the why is not the what happens. Excuse me, not the hows. Why did this happen? Not what happened. When you're writing an analysis, you are not writing about what happened. You're about writing about why this happened. So sure, Hale quit the court, but why? Okay, you would instead want to include a quote about how he started to realize the girls were lying to him. What really brought him around to that? <coughs> he writes a quote, he talks about how many death sentences he wrote, he wrote and how guilty he feels about that. Yeah, cool, but why? All right, why does he start to believe that? Why does he quit the court? Why does he realize that he no longer wants to be part of the Salem witch trials? Um, an analytic literary analysis essay is looking for the whys, not the what happens. So just be very, very cautious of that in the choosing of your quotes, as well as what is it you actually start to cover, okay? Um, it is very, you may be able to answer a question with your intuition, okay? You might have a very strong sense of inferencing. And if you're asked a question about a text, you can rapidly put details together and tell and give an answer. And that's fantastic. Um, however, being able to explain how you got to that conclusion is very important and very useful. Okay. Um, I, like I said, I also teach sixth grade and that skill has not fully been developed yet. That mental capacity has not necessarily been developed yet. Some of my more advanced students are definitely already there and they can follow their train of thought and explain and show reasoning and evidence. Some of them get there over the course of the year and some still struggle with it by the end of the year. But by the time you're in high school, being able to provide evidence for your beliefs and evidence for your claims is very, very important. Um, and by integrating the quote properly and following it up, you've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you understand the path that information took to reach you and your understanding of the text and your inferences, okay? That you took it from implications in the text to a proper inference to answer the question. Okay, um, I try not to hold on too long for these shorter lessons. Um, the plagiarism class is definitely one of my longer ones. Uh, the welcome class is the longest. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions. If anyone has questions about essays, quotes, um, we are heading in solidly to the first essay, which is the Crucible essay. Um, a couple of those rough drafts have been turned in already by the people that started smack on the first day of school. Um, and then I have, you know, everyone else is going to roll in over the course of the next week. Um, so I wanted to get this lesson out there before it becomes any uh, larger issue. So if you have any questions, you can either come on mic or you can write it in the chat box if you prefer. Um, and I will take a minute to answer those. Uh, no, actually, that would not be correct. Um, I, I believe the methods of citing images have actually changed over recent times, so I am actually not a thousand percent certain on how to do that. However, I would encourage you to Google, and I'm going to put this in there, um, OWL at Purdue citing images. Throw this into Google and read the uh, resource that pops up because that's the resource I always give students when they're asking about citing images. Yes, you always have to cite everything. 
either a quote that you use or an image that you use, especially, yeah, always. I'll even take I'll even take credit off if you fail to cite your images. Um, so for the persuasive timed essay, um, you will not be given the topic until you actually enter the test. You will have an hour, I believe, tops. Um, so for that reason, I would not go too crazy. You do not have to complete any research or anything to go along with it. It is 100% um, entirely opinion based. That's why it's considered persuasive. It's going to give you a topic like school uniforms or something for using cell phones in school, that kind of stuff. So something that you're going to be able to develop your own opinion on. Um, you're going to want to use the methods for persuasion that you learned about um, in the unit. And like I said, you have a maximum of an hour. So do not write me a 12 page essay or anything like that because you're simply not going to have the time. Um, I believe they want it to be written like you're, write, you're writing a speech to be read to an audience. Um, so a fairly you can either take a formal tone like you're speaking to the school board or you can take like a conversational tone like you're talking to um, your classmates. Like if you're trying to like a pep rally or whatever, either of those would be fine. But just make it clear who your audience is. Um, like at the beginning of your speech, ladies and gentlemen of the school board or my dear fellow students or something like that, make it clear who your audience is. And then your tone will seem appropriate when you follow through. Yeah, no problem. Um, students do tend to follow the five paragraph method um, with the exception of adding, like if it's a four paragraph essay, but it does a great job of supporting the thesis, eh, it's fine. If it's a six paragraph essay that does a good job of supporting the thesis, eh, it's fine. Um, if you're comfortable in the five paragraph method, go for it, that's fine. Um, but you are allowed to extend out of that and go more or less. Um, I do want to see at least a solid two body paragraphs, though. So I would say no less than four. Um, and again, it does need to make sure that it properly supports that thesis. So you don't need to be held down by the five paragraph box. Um, that's something that's taught from an early, you know, sixth grade, whatever, uh, middle school. But um, it's a good method to start with, but if you want to go, you know, one or two more than that, if you want to go up to seven. Um, the only thing that I would warn you of of going to too many paragraphs is the one issue I've seen with that is that some of those paragraphs can end up too small and not really containing any solid evidence. Um, so in some cases, some of those tiny paragraphs can be combined into one. But yeah, you, you certainly don't need to give me an essay longer, longer than, gosh, three pages would probably be maximum. Um, you can solidly prove your point in that much space. There, we don't give a word count. We don't give a page count for those reasons um, because there's a lot of flexible ways. Like I have, I have writers that are near perfect that can do, that can complete the, as they know, the question in like two and a half pages. And I have terrible writers that give me five pages of mumbo jumbo. So yeah, hope that helps. It's not too confusing. Hello? Yeah. Oh, I turned in my literary turns project and the turn it in, it says that it's 29% plagiarized. I didn't plagiarize it though, but when I was looking through it, it was just the quote. So am I just, am I fine? Oh yeah. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. Um, it depends on how Turnitin is set. 
sometimes turn it into set to look for anything that might be repeated anywhere mm -hmm. else on the entire internet. And sometimes I'm able to set it to ignore things that like quotes and bibliographies and stuff like that. Um, I don't think I have it set like that for right now. Um, I think I have to set that every semester, but it, yeah, don't worry about that. I'm sure it's my 29% in the literary terms project is totally acceptable. All right, thank you. No problem. All right, unless anyone else has any questions, I do appreciate you ladies for coming. I do definitely appreciate um, attendees to my classes. I will post this as a recording for everyone that is not present. Um, and I do hope to see improvement in writing. I hope to see that you've used some of the things that we've talked about. Um, again, if you have any further questions, texting is the best way to get a hold of me, especially during the school day. Um, outside of normal, human hours um please email like if it's like after 8 p.m or before 8 a.m uh email all right i'll hang out for a second if you have any other questions other than that you are free to go and i definitely appreciate your attendance you too Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one sentence is acceptable. I mean, especially for words like archaism, you know, uh, this word isn't used anymore. So it's an archaism. What else am I going to say? You know, um, some of them are might need to be a little bit longer because they need to talk about significance, but some of them are going to be super short. <laughs> That's the one that are, they're always like, um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Alrighty. Sounds great. I'll have a great rest of your day.